He chose to drink that bitter cup. Yes, he did. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 24. Levi, Matthew the publican, the burden of his gospel is the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom, 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 kingdom. Time and time again, he mentions it. In Matthew chapter number 24, we come down to the time of the end. You ask the average person on the street, and they'll say, oh, yeah, we think we're approaching the time of the end. Many of them will say, yes, the apocalyptic time. So in Matthew chapter number 24 and verse number 1, he, Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say to you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And it happened exactly as he said in 70 A.D. And as he said upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Heavy duty questions. Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Deception is associated with the second coming of Christ. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. You shall hear of wars, rumors of wars, see you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, pestilences, earthquakes, and divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Read the news lately? And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and, he shall, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, been watching lately, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Watch carefully now, associated with that. But this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. I preach the gospel of the grace of God. I told you before, the burden of the gospel of Matthew is the gospel of the kingdom. It was still in vogue. It was still present. It was still being offered when this book was written as the apostle records what Christ was saying. Verse number 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. How could this be if the temple is going to be destroyed? For well, there will be a third temple. That temple must be rebuilt. It's not the one the Messiah builds. He shall build the temple of the Lord, the scripture says. This is not that temple. This is the temple of the tribulation period. This is where the abomination of desolation. He also says this too now. There are those that place the abomination of desolation back to Antiochus Epiphanes back in the, about the 3rd century B.C., 2nd century, and say that was the fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. And the Lord makes it very clear here that it is a future event. The abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. Let them which be on the housetop not come down to take anything out of this house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to his, take his clothes. And woe to them that are with child, to them that give suck in those days. Have you read what they did to pregnant women over there? But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the what? Now we know he's talking to Jews. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Father, bless this holy word now. And give me unction, Lord. Give me enough sense to preach it. In thy holy name, amen. You can be seated. These are the headlines this morning. China deploys six warships to Middle East over fears Israel crisis could spark World War III. This from the Daily Express by Isabella Durso, dated October the 21st, 2023. The Chinese military has deployed its 44th Naval Escort Task Force to the Middle East amid rising tensions in Israel. Headline, China issues chilling war warning to U.S. after harrowing double threat report released. China warned the U.S. that though, quote, those who play with fire will perish by it, 
unquote, after Congressional Commission reported Washington is not ready to handle the double threat of China and Russia. This by Aurora Bossati, and this was in the Daily Express, dated October 15, 2023. In the Daily Mail, headline, Israel vows to cut off the head of the snake and launch a military attack against Iran if Hezbollah joins the war with Hamas. This is uh, Natalie Lisboni, Mark Hookman, and Anna Mikhailova, uh, dated 21 October 2023. This came from Nir Barkat, Israel's Minister of Economy. He gave an exclusive mail on Sunday interview. Israel last night vowed to cut off the head of the snake and launch a military attack against Iran if Tehran-backed terror group Hezbollah joins the war. In an exclusive interview with the Mail on Sunday, Nir Barkat, Israel's Minister of Economy, warned that Iran's ayatollahs will be wiped off the face of the earth should Hezbollah, their proxy terror group in Lebanon, attack Israel. His incendiary comments raised the grave specter of a rapidly escalating regional conflict and come ahead of an expected Israeli ground invasion of the Gaza Strip to annihilate Hamas. Israel has made it plain they intend to wipe Hamas from the face of this earth. And Hezbollah has said that if Israel enters into the Gaza Strip to do that, then Hezbollah will get into this war. Now, what do you think? Here we are. We're ready for something to happen. When you go to Palestine, and the name Palestine is a misnomer, it was added by the Romans to uh, humiliate Israel when they were driven from their land. But in any event, if you look at the factions in Palestine, you have Hamas. This is the bloodthirsty murdering devils that did what they have done. You have Fatah. This is the Palestinian Authority led by Mahmoud Abbas. You have the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. You have the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine. You have the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, all jockeying for power over this two-state solution. Imagine what I, I put that in. I said that in jest, by the way. Lebanon is, uh, is uh, it right now has Hezbollah. This is an Iranian-supported proxy. Proxy simply means uh, though uh, Iran is not personally doing the shooting, they're giving them the, the, the weapons to do the shooting and supporting them, and therefore they are an extension of the arm of Iran. Iran can be found in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. And I talked about them the other day when we talked about a plausible scenario. And, nation, and Iran is a nation state, unlike Hamas or unlike Palestine, uh, the, the, the Islamic Jihad or Hezbollah. It is a nation state. Therefore, it is recognized in the world as a state and it has a whole lot more power than Hezbollah or Hamas. It is considered part of what's called the axis of evil. The axis of evil is a constantly changing thing depending on what time you live. For example, the axis of evil in World War II was Germany, Japan, Italy, and a few others. But these three main players were the axis of evil. The axis of evil today is considered to be China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea, and others that may support them. The word hegemony is a very important word as I deal with this message this morning. It comes from the Greek word hegemon. The Greek word hegemon means influence, leadership, control, power, as it reaches out to control areas and people. And of course, this has to do with the security of nations. Hegemony, every nation has its hegemony. The United States of America, Russia, China, all exercise hegemony. In other words, you're not going to get but so close to the United States. You're only going to get so close to Russia. You're only going to get so close to China. And they will challenge you on the spot for what you're doing. A perfect storm. What is a perfect storm? The meteorological event aggravated by a rare combination of circumstances. We are looking at the possibility of a perfect storm. Now follow with me. A perfect storm. Something that probably most of the players had not envisioned nor really wanted to happen. But events can happen that suck people or nation states into a perfect storm. For example, China just hosted the 10th anniversary of the Belt and Road Forum. What is that? Well, it's a play back on the words of the Silk Road. How many of you remember that as your study? The Silk Road is a very important trade route. 
welcome leaders from dozens of countries. As a matter of fact, 155 countries belong to the Belt and Road Forum. This is led by China. China, my dear friend, by doing this, is exercising their hegemony. The 75% of the world's population, 75% of the world's population is part of the Belt and Road Forum. More than half of the world's gross domestic, uh, domestic product. What's that? Goods and services, um, power, economic power, as it reaches forth from that country. So we're talking about the Belt and Road Initiative or Forum controlling a huge part of the world. Clearly, China has its sights on world leadership and domination. No question. Russia is a close friend. Putin has met with Xi uh, more than 40 times in the last few years. At the forum, recorded, uh, reported by the Wall Street Journal, he was invited to speak directly after Xi, Russian leader Vladimir Putin, praised what he said were the trillion dollar infrastructure program efforts to build a fairer, multipolar world and system of international relations, according to a translation of the Chinese state broadcaster, CGT. And what are we talking about? New world order. There are two new world orders emerging, and they're going to be butting heads. You have the eastern branch of the new world order, but then you have the western branch of the new world order. And one of its precepts is called the Great Reset. How many has ever heard of that one? The Great Reset. This is reported in the Hill by Justin Haskins, dated 6-25-20. Introducing the Great Reset, world leaders' radical plan to transform the economy. Have you noticed how the economy in the United States of America is changing before your very eyes? You ever wondered about that? You ever wondered about the fact that, the, that, this, uh, that this plague that came into this country late uh, 2019, early 2020, has had such an effect upon people and our economy. It's quite a remarkable thing. For decades, progressives have attempted to use climate change to justify liberal policy changes. But their latest attempt, a new proposal called the Great Reset, is the most ambitious radical plan the world has seen in more than a generation. At a virtual meeting early in June hosted by the World Economic Forum, some of the planet's most powerful business leaders, government officials, and activists announced a proposal to reset the global economy. Uh, the United States of America is part of the globe. Instead of traditional capitalism, the high-profile group said the world should adopt more socialistic policies, such as wealth taxes, additional regulations, and massive Green New Deal-like government programs. That's when you shut off the oil flow and become dependent upon other countries for your resources. Amen. Every country from the United States to China, to China listen to this, every country from the United States to China, here we go with hegemony, reaching out to China. China wants no part of it. Remember what we just read to you a few moments ago? Must participate in every industry from oil and gas to tech must be transformed, wrote Klaus Schwab, the founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, in an article published on the West website, quote, in short, we need a great reset of capitalism. Bernie Sanders supports this. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez supports this in their Green New Deal. Put another way, we need a form of socialism. This is my take on socialism. Socialism is economic fascism. And go get a book and read what fascism is all about. Benito Mussolini and uh, the leader of Spain, World War II, wasn't it? Uh, uh, forget his name now. These were socialists. Not only that, but Hitler, the National Socialist Party, that was part of their name in Germany, World War II. Socialism my dear friend, is not what you want. But this is economic hegemony. Remember that word hegemony? Reaching out, taking authority and control over others. We have more than one group, therefore, that is pushing for global economic control. Now, my dear friend, World War II brought Japan into it. The reason Japan came into it, because their oil was shut off. They went into, into, uh, into the, northern, uh, the, no the northeastern part of China. And they went in there, and they started taking land, and one thing led to another. First thing you know, we're in a shooting war. 
Six steps from World War III. I'm going to give you six of them this morning. Step number one, Israel overreacts. What is an overreaction? Israel cuts off the head of the snake. That would be an overreaction, according to some. Now remember, according to some, Israel overreacts. Number two, war spreads to Lebanon. Number three, Syria and Russia team up. You remember Ezekiel 38 and 39? You remember Russia? Number four, Iran gets involved or kicks off. They seize the opportunity. Opportunity, folk, opportunist. You've got to watch them. The opportunity. Number five, the UK, United Kingdom, and the US enter the fight. We've got two aircraft carriers right now sitting in the Mediterranean. One aircraft carrier is an enormous amount of power, folks. Enormous power. We've got two of them over there. And of course, that doesn't even count the Trident submarines. Number six, Saudi Arabia is forced in. And then what happens? World War I started like this. Listen to this. This is from the History Channel. World War I. A number of alliances involving European powers, the Ottoman Empire, Russia, other parties had existed for years. But political instability, do we see any political instability? In the Balkans, particularly Bosnia, Serbia, and Herzegovina, threatened to destroy these agreements. The spark that ignited World War I was struck in Sarajevo, Bosnia, where Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, was shot to death along with his wife, Sophie, by the Serbian nationalist Gavrilo Princip on June the 28th, 1914. Princip and other nationalists were struggling to end Austro-Hungarian rule over Bosnia and Herzegovina. Seemed like something like that wouldn't start a world war. But the assassination of Franz Ferdinand set off a rapidly escalating chain of events. This is what to look for. The chain of events. Things that may not be foreseen. And it right now, everything over there, folks, folks east of the Mediterranean, is a powder keg ready to blow up. So, the assassination of Franz Ferdinand set off a rapidly escalating chain of events. Austria-Hungary, like many countries around the world, blamed the Serbian government for the attack and hoped to use the incident as justification for settling the question of Serbian nationalism once and for all. In plain words, old grievances, old problems, uh, when something like, th like this happens, they seize the opportunity. These Jews are hated. They're despised. It's amazing to me at the vitriol that is directed toward them. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed college professors now? College professors, folks. Not some brain-dead 18-year-old, but college professors standing up telling people to kill the Jews and even celebrating what had happened to them. And it's unbelievable. Now let's talk about the Islamic Jesus. How many of you know anything about the Islamic Jesus? Let's read a little bit about him. The Islamic Jesus. You see, you say, preacher, you mean that Muslims believe in Jesus? Oh, yes, they believe in him. Oh, yeah. Now, if, you, if I just left it at that statement, you'd think, well, good night, they're Christians then. No, 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 no. No, no, no. They've got another Jesus and another Christ. But here are some of the points. Number one, they call him Issa. Okay, they don't call him Jesus, they call him Issa. He's in the Quran. He's the son of Mary. He's a prophet of God. He's a Messiah. All right, a Messiah. He was condemned to crucifixion, but was miraculously saved and raised to the heavens. He did not die on the cross, according to Islam. Uh, instead of Issa being crucified, a lookalike was crucified. Now, keep this in mind. Muhammad died in 632 A.D. His father-in-law was Abu Bakr. His, his cousin was Ali. When Muhammad died, a struggle started immediately over who was going to run Islam, who was going to be the boss, who was going to be the head, because Muhammad was, but then when he passed on, now what's going to happen? This is where the Shia and the Sunni Muslim began to divide. The Shia Muslim went after Abu Bakr. The, uh, the, rather, they went after Ali. 
the Sunni Muslim went after Abu Bakr and the Caliphate. And now since then, they've been fighting each other. And to this very day, they still have no use for each other, but they'll use each other. Because Hamas is a Sunni Muslim group, but they are a proxy of a Shiite Muslim country. Iran is Shiite. And so you can see how that they will use each other when they have to because the enemy of my enemy is my friend. That's the old axiom. How many's heard that before? That's the old axiom. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so sometimes when they find their enemy and he's defined, clearly defined, then they'll join forces against him. We have a situation here where they believe he will return. Who? Issa, Jesus, is going to come back. And some say to a white minaret east of Damascus to the minaret of Isa or Issa at the Umayyad mosque. He will kill the Dajjal. This is a false Messiah. He will destroy the cross and declare faith in Allah. In other words, the Muslim faith is the true faith and Christianity is a, is a fabrication and it's, a, and, and it's not truthful. They believe that the New Testament and the Old Testament is not uh, reliable. They believe it's full of errors. It's not inspired. They believe that the Koran is the only inspired scripture on this earth and the Hadith, which is the interpretation of it, the sayings of Muhammad and others, is how you interpret the Koran. So keep in mind, the Koran and the Hadith, you gotta have both of them because the Koran may say one thing but you need to know what they said about it. So you get the Hadith. So in Shiite prophecy, they look for the 12th Imam this is the Mahdi. According to Islamic prophecy, the Mahdi's return will be preceded by a number of events. Now listen carefully to these things. They're important. There will be three years of horrendous world chaos, and he will rule over the world and the Arabs for seven years. That's amazing how that matches the Bible, doesn't it? Isn't that remarkable? According to Shiite teachings, Jesus, Issa, will accept the Mahdi's leadership and the two great branches of the Abraham's family, of Abraham's family, will be reunited forever. Now, of course, I told you there are 2.8 billion Christians on this earth and 1.9 billion Muslims. All right? This is part of what's called the Abrahamic religion. But there's another group that recognizes Abraham as their father. Who would that be? The Jews, of course. Islamic extremists are trying to hasten the coming of the Mahdi. This is the National Review, Joel Rosenberg, September 11th. Remember the date now, 2015. 15, eight years ago. Here's what he said eight years ago. We face not just, quote, we face not just one, but two regional regimes whose rulers are driven not merely by violent political ideology or by extremist theology, but by apocalyptic genocidal eschatology or end times theology, unquote. Apocalyptic means a conflagration, a war, you know, a, a, a nation against nation. Genocidal means we're wiping certain groups of people from the face of the earth. And eschatology is simply the Greek word, which means the doctrine of last things, eschatos. Quote, the first is the Islamic Republic of Iran. The second is the Islamic State or ISIS. Now remember, 2015, who would be in there now? Hamas, the leaders of the former are Shia, that's Shiite, the latter are Sunni. Both believe that we are living in the end of days as predicted in their ancient prophecies. Both believe that any moment now, their Messiah, the Mahdi, will be revealed on earth as he establishes his global Islamic kingdom and impose Sharia law. Both believe that Jesus will return not as the Savior or Son of God, which they do not believe he's the Son of God. God is one. God is one in, in Islamic theology. But as a lieutenant to the Mahdi, and that he will force non-Muslims to convert or die. What's more, both believe that the Mahdi will come only... Now, this is, this is important. If you don't get anything else... Get a hold of this because it'll, 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 it'll put you where you understand why this is happening. Both believe that the Mahdi will come only when the world is engulfed in chaos and carnage. Are we in it now? Are we stepping into it now? They openly vow not simply to attack, 
But to annihilate the United States and Israel, Iran and ISIS are both eager to hasten the coming of the Mahdi. Now that makes sense, doesn't it? We don't want a war. Do you want a war? I don't want a war. I don't want a war. But they do. Both believe that the day of judgment is coming soon when they will be either rewarded for their actions or condemned to hell for eternity. And I've been told a thousand times, if not once, that the only way that a Muslim can be absolutely certain that he's going to go to heaven is to die as a shaheed. In other words, a martyr. To die a martyr's death. And that when Hamas attacked Israel, these kibbutz, kibbutzim, kibbutzim it's many, kibbutz is one, and it's just, a, it's just a community of people who get together, kind of socialistic, they share their resources. When they attacked them, they knew or they considered themselves to be martyrs that were giving their lives and they intended to die in what they were doing, just as those who flew into the World Trade Towers from Saudi Arabia. They believe the day of judgment's coming. They either be rewarded actions or condemned to hell for eternity. Both are receiving relatively minimal international opposition. Consequently, both believe that Allah is on their side, that the wind is at their back, and that victory is both assured and imminent. Now, does that help understand a little bit about what's going on? All right, now let's go to the Bible. He said, if I go away, I will come again to receive into myself. But where I am, there you may be also. You hear people talking, Christians talking all the time about the second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ comes in different installments. It's not just one event. The second coming of Christ is a coming of Christ back to this earth, but he comes back at different times. The truth of the matter is, at least three that I can think of, and there's a possibility of four. But one is to come and, uh, well, I'm going to get ahead of myself. In John 14, 3, he said, I'll come again. But the kingdom was offered a second time to Israel in the early chapters of the book of Acts. The kingdom was offered. Remember the kingdom. It was offered a second time. This is why you don't hear anything about a rapture. You don't hear anything about a rapture in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the reason you don't is because up until the apostle Paul was called, everything was conditional. It could have gone different ways. You remember what they said about John the Baptist? He said, he shall come in the spirit and power of Elijah, right? But then the Lord Jesus told them in Matthew 17, he said, if you will receive it, this is Elijah, which was for to come. Well, it wouldn't just simply mean he represents Elijah. It simply means if he had come as Elijah, then everything that Elijah was coming for at that time would have happened. But it didn't. So they rejected him. So when they rejected this second offer in the early chapter of the book of Acts, what did he do? Well, they stoned Stephen to death. And the Lord Jesus stands up at the right hand of the Father. He looks down upon this earth. And then immediately, God saves Saul of Tarsus. He takes him into Arabia. He begins to reveal the gospel of the grace of God to Saul of Tarsus. No kingdom gospel, no kingdom, but the gospel of the grace of God because the kingdom now was in abeyance. It was pushed forward into the future. Now we're preaching the grace of God, Jew and Gentile, bond and free, no, one, no difference whatsoever. And when he revealed that gospel of the grace of God to the apostle in Arabia, he also revealed to him the mystery of the body of Christ. You don't hear anything about the body of Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the mystery of the body of Christ. You really don't hear the blood expounded through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John like the apostle Paul did that and the apostle Peter. You're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold by, from your vain conver conversation re received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ that came from Peter. And so we have these revelations about mysteries, mysteries that were not revealed in the life of Christ. And the mystery of the rapture of the church of God was revealed to Paul because it is the church of God. It is the church that was in a mystery form until the Jew had finally rejected the kingdom. And now this mystery is what we're looking forward to now. He said in 1 Corinthians 15, I'll show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. Well, the second coming of Christ is no mystery. He said, if I go, I'll come again. So you see what I mean? But he said, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, twinkling of an eye. 
In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he gets into detail. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, trump of God. Dead in Christ shall rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. It's called the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. Amen. Righteousness is a person. Salvation is a person. And hope is a person. The Lord Jesus Christ. He is all of that to us. He's everything that we need. Amen, folks. There's nothing out here existing on its own that you need that's not Christ. He's everything. Amen. Hey, glory to God. So what are you doing then, preacher? Well, I don't know what's going to happen here. You know, they may invade. The, they may be right now, for all I know. This is the first day of the week. Saturday is the Jewish Sabbath. All right? Not today. And the tanks may be rolling, for all I know. And, and this week may be the most... May, <laughs> it may be the most important week that has happened in a long time because these different factions may be coming coming in who knows i don't know so what do you do preacher i listen for a shout Amen. Amen. this kind of this kind of stuff that gets me excited yeah it does it really does i mean a, a lot's happened in the last month yeah, it has a lot has happened in the last month and I get up in the morning and I think, well, now what's going on? There's seven hours ahead of us. What's happened in Jerusalem already? <laughs> For, now, yeah, I do. And it's called a blessed hope. It's the rapture of the church. It's a mystery thing. And who's he coming for, preacher? He's coming for the body of Christ. Amen. Is he coming for Baptists and Presbyterians and Lutherans and Episcopalians and Charismatics? No, he didn't care anything about that. He's coming for born-again believers. Amen. That's who he's coming for. Amen. <laughs> and when he comes to get you, you'll drop all your medals and all your accolades and all your junk and you get all, and it'll just be you. And that's good enough for me. And where he is, I will be also. And heaven is a place that is a person. And all the rest of it's peripheral, incidental. The idea of heaven is a person, a person. To be absent from the bodies, to be present with the gold, gates of gold, gates of, gates of pearls, streets of gold. No, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with what? The Lord, amen. I don't know what he's got in mind for the future, but his mind is a good mind, and he'll take care of what needs to be done. My hope is in Christ Jesus the Lord. Amen. So, preacher, you're going to go out here today and worry yourself to death and won't be able to sleep tonight? I'll sleep like a baby. Amen. Have my prayer roll over and go to sleep. Amen. And so he comes to get us tonight. Amen. Are you ready, though? Are you ready? He's coming, folks. How many believe he came the first time? Amen. Good. Well, buddy, he's coming the second time. Right, I'll come again. The rapture. Glory to God. Are you ready for him? Yes. Now, how many of you, just to be honest, how many of you believe that what's going on over there now is just, not just a you know, bunch of people mad at each other, that there may be a whole lot more going on over there right now than has yeah. been given something going on over there big time big time folks big time are you ready brother come up and lead us in something give folks opportunity are you ready well how do i get ready preacher well if you're not born again ask the lord to save you amen, amen. if you are saved start living for him amen. consecrate and dedicate your life to the lord amen looking for that the bible said he appeared the second time without sin into salvation for those that look for his appearing that's a controversial verse that's a heavy-duty verse. Think about it. For those that look for his appearing. Are you looking for his appearing? Yes. Amen. That adds excitement for the rest of this day. It'll be excitement for tomorrow. Yes. People say, what in the world's got this preacher all fired up? Lord's coming back. That's what's got me fired up. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. What do we got, brother?